the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear more selections from Caravan of Dreams by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. The Tale of Melon City The ruler of a certain city one day decided that he would like a triumphal arch built, so that he could ride under it with all pomp for the desirable edification of the multitude. But when the great moment came, his crown was knocked off. The arch had been built too low. The ruler therefore ordained in his rightful wrath that the chief of the builders should be hanged. Gallows were prepared, but, as he was being taken to the place of execution, the master builder called out that it was all the fault of the workmen who had done the actual construction job. The king, with his customary sense of justice, called the workers to account but they escaped the charge by explaining the masons said that they had only carried out the orders of the architect. He, in turn, reminded the king that his majesty had, at the last moment, made some amendments of his own to the plans, changing them. Summon the wisest man in the country, said the ruler, for this is undoubtedly a difficult problem, and we need counsel. The wisest man was carried in, unable to stand on his own feet, so ancient, and therefore so wise, was he. It is evident, he quavered, that in law the actual culprit must be punished, and that is, in this case, quite evidently, none other than the arch itself. Applauding his decision, the king ordered that the offending arch be carried to the scaffold. But as it was being taken there, one of the royal councillors pointed out that this arch was something which had actually touched the august head of the monarch, and must surely never be disgraced by the rope of execution. As in the meantime, exhausted by his exertions, the venerable wise man had breathed his last, the people were unable to apply to him for an interpretation of this new observation. The doctors of law, however, decreed that the lower part of the arch, which had not touched anything at all, could be hanged for the crime of the whole arch. But when the executioner tried to put the arch into the noose, he found that the rope was too short. The rope maker was called, but he soon explained that in his opinion, It was the scaffold that was too high. He suggested that the carpenters were at fault. The crowd is getting impatient, said the king, and we must therefore quickly find someone to hang. We can postpone the consideration of finer points like guilt until a later, more convenient occasion. In a surprisingly short time, all the people in the city had been carefully measured but only one was found to be tall enough to fit the gallows. It was the king himself. Such was the popular enthusiasm at the discovery of a man who would fit, that the king had to conform, and he was hanged. Thank goodness we found someone, said the prime minister, for if we had not satisfied the appetite of the mob, they would undoubtedly have turned against the crown. But there were important matters to consider, for almost at once it was realized that the king was dead. In conformity with custom, announced the heralds in the streets, the first man who passes the city gate shall decide who is to be our next great ruler. The very next man to wander past the gate was an idiot. He was quite unlike the ordinary, sensible citizens with whom we have become familiar, and when he was asked who should be king, immediately said, 
a melon. This was because he always said a melon to every question. In fact, he thought about nothing else, being very fond of melons. And thus it came about that a melon was, with due ceremony, crowned. Now that was years and years ago. Nowadays, when people ask the inhabitants of that land why their king seems to be a melon, they say, oh, because of customary choice. His Majesty evidently desires to be a melon. Certainly we shall allow him to remain one until his further pleasure be known. He has, in our country, every right to be what he wants to be. We are content with that, so long as he doesn't interfere in our lives. Haughty and Generous A certain rich man named Khalil was famed far and wide for his ability to maintain, at one and the same time, the two characteristics of auteur and generosity which are held by many people to produce the ideal nature. He had a friend called Aziz, a rich merchant, whose affairs came to grief through some disastrous commercial transaction. Aziz called his son Ali and said to him, My son, go to the haughty and generous Khalil. Tell him that your father has sent you. Ask him to loan me a camel load of silver, if you will be so generous, which I shall repay with profit to him when my affairs are once again in order. Ali set off for the house of Khalil. When he arrived there, he was shown into the audience hall, where Khalil was sitting. He was so haughty that he would hardly look upon the youth, and sat with his face averted from the company. It was only after several hours that Ali was able to make his request. Khalil looked at him with the utmost hauteur, and said, Leave my presence immediately. As the wretched Ali was making his way back through the courtyard of the house, he was handed the leading rein of a long string of camels, each one loaded with as many sacks of gold and jewels and robes of honour as it could carry. Aziz was overjoyed when Ali returned with the treasures, and after many months of trading he amassed a huge profit. He said to Ali, My son, here is a caravan with double the amount of wealth which Khalil so generously, albeit haughtily, lent us. Hasten and deliver it to him with the gratitude of your father. Ali made his way again to Khalil's house, this time gaining admission only after waiting for several days. When, at last, he was allowed to speak to Khalil, who was sitting in the same manner as if he had never moved, he said, Noble sir, I am Ali, son of Aziz, come with my father's thanks and greetings to return, together with a legitimate profit, the amount of money which you had in your generosity lent to a beggar without any security. Khalil looked at him for a long time. Then he said, Ali, son of Aziz, you and your father, though impressed, cannot understand the nature and extent of my chief characteristics. Get out of here, with your money and your camels and your goods. Generosity is not lending. I am not your father's banker. If you regret kissing me, take back your kiss. Proverb May your shadow never grow less. Proverb The Chests of Gold Once upon a time there was a rich merchant who went away on a long journey, leaving his steward in charge of his money. A crafty and dishonest man overheard him say to the steward, You are in sole charge. I have in my strong room a hundred chests of gold. In each chest there are a hundred gold pieces. Guard them well until I return. The crafty man scraped up an acquaintanceship with the steward, 
and they often used to sit drinking coffee together. One day the crafty man said, I am something of an alchemist. If I can get one gold piece I can double it so that it becomes two. At first the steward did not believe him, but after a time he was tempted to make a test using some of his employer's money. You only borrow it, said the crafty man, and you keep it in your own hands here in the coffee house. If it does not multiply, what can you lose? Eventually the steward agreed. He took one piece from his master's hoard and put it in a cunningly contrived box which the alchemist supplied. When they opened the lid, there were two pieces inside. Thus encouraged, and being presented with the extra piece as a gift, the steward asked the alchemist if he could repeat the process. Yes, certainly, said the crafty man, but there are certain rules. First you must take only one coin from each box of coins that you have, however many that may be. Bring them here. The steward did as he was told, and one by one, the hundred coins became two hundred. And now for the next rule, said the crafty man. And that is, you must not replace doubled coins in the same box. Get another box and put the two hundred in that. Then spend from the new box until your own hundred are finished. This will leave your master's capital untouched, and you will have gained one hundred pieces of gold. The steward did as he was told. He started to spend his own share, and sure enough, he found that the doubled pieces were real gold, accepted without question in the shops. He had never had so much money in his life, and he spent a lot of it on drink and other personal indulgences, encouraged by the alchemist who told him, As soon as that hundred is finished, tell me, and we will be able to repeat the process but not before. When the time came for the merchant's return, the steward was well addicted to drink. The merchant, when he saw him, said, What kind of steward are you? I suppose that you have spent my money on yourself. On the contrary, mumbled the steward, I have multiplied it. The merchant ran to his hoard, but there did not seem to be anything missing so far as he could see. At that moment the crafty man appeared on the scene and said to the merchant, and Give me the money that you have been keeping for me. What money? said the merchant. I have never seen you before in my life. Such an argument started that the police were called, and they carried the pair to the court of summary judgment. This man has my money which he was keeping for me, said the thief to the judge. How much do you say it is? said the judge. Nine thousand nine hundred and fifty gold pieces, ninety-nine to a chest, one chest with only fifty pieces in it, said the crafty man, who had been keeping count of what the steward spent. That is a lie and I can prove it, said the merchant. I had a hundred boxes with a hundred pieces in each, which I left with my steward. There is either that amount left, which is ten thousand gold pieces in all, or something less than that if the steward has been robbing me. There cannot be the number that this man says. An order was made by the court to inspect the gold. It was found to tally exactly with the thief's story. The steward was regarded as bereft of his reason by alcoholism and could not be admitted as a witness. The court awarded the whole of the money to the crafty man, who became a popular and respected citizen. The Lowliest of the Arabs The caliph Harun al-Rashid was of the Prophet's tribe, but not being descended from him, was considered to be lower in rank than the Sayyids of the Hashemite clan. But he was, after all, an emperor, 
and when he heard that a certain Said was being hailed by his followers as noblest of all the Arabs, he called the man before him. O Said, said the caliph, I am junior in descent to you, since you are of the blood of the holy prophet. But have you not heard that the messenger formally abolished all title to nobility based upon blood? In that case, said the Said, I am still the noblest of all the Arabs. How can that be? asked the caliph. Even the lowliest of the Arabs, once brought into the presence of such a king, must consider this honour to elevate him to the rank of noblest of the Arabs, said the Said. Now that it is gone, does it matter whether a cow ate it or not? Proverb This podcast is copyright 2016, the Idris Shah Foundation.